Hey, welcome back to Accelerated Investor. Hey, I'm Josh, and I'm so excited to have you on. Uh, today, my guest on the podcast is AJ Osborne. AJ is an absolute stud at owning and managing and structuring self-storage facilities. He owns over $100 million in assets. He's a national speaker, and he was actually on the Accelerated Investor podcast about 18 months ago, back in July of 2020. So I've asked AJ to come back and talk a little bit about how self-storage has changed uh, over the last 18 months with people working from home and with COVID um, impacting people's you know, work and, and home life. Um, secondly, we're going to talk about traits of elite entrepreneurs and how to build an amazing real estate empire and achieve financial freedom. And third, we're going to talk a little bit about the key performance indicators and some performance numbers uh, in self-storage and specifically AJ's portfolio and how they've held up and done uh, over the last two years, roughly, of, uh, you know, kind of operating in the middle of COVID. Uh, AJ is a stud. He's also uh, a leader in the industry of technology and self-storage automation, and he's built one of the largest facilities in the country that's fully automated using technology. Uh, you'll love this interview on our Accelerated Real Estate Investor Podcast with AJ Osborne. And of course, if you missed the first one back in July of 2020, make sure you check out that episode as well. Here we go. Welcome to the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. If you're looking to retire early with forever passive income, you're in the right place. This podcast is the go-to destination for real estate investors, both active and passive, and multifamily apartment investors, both new, intermediate, and advanced. Now, sit back, listen, learn, and accelerate your business, your life, and your investing with the Accelerated Investor Podcast. So AJ, listen, welcome back to Accelerated Investor, man. You've been busy. It's been uh, it's been 18 months, man, July of 2020 since you were last on the show. You are now a top 70 self-storage operator in the world. You're an absolute yeah. savage, man. So welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for uh, having me. It's, it's crazy. Like I was saying, it's it's crazy. It's been that long. It seems like it was seriously yesterday we were chatting. So been busy, accomplished a, a lot, and that flew by. Yeah. So tell our people. So if you if you guys want to reference back, um, AJ was on Accelerated Investor. It was episode 131 back in July of 2020. And in that episode, AJ, we talked a lot about the strategy of investing in self-storage. Yeah. Um, so tell us again, just real quick, like what what is investing in self-storage? How do you do it? Tell us about the strategy. Let's start with that. Just kind of dust that off for us a minute. And then we'll kind of get into Give what's you a little going on snapshot, right? Like a little, yeah. a little. So really there's three strategies. Um, first of all, we have the value add strategy, right? So we're buying underperforming mom and pops and we're turning them around. And that's where we've set our whole entire company. So we're, we're fully integrated, meaning we fund, we manage, we um, uh, do our, all our own syndicating, operating. We own our own tech stack, our own data. We do all the revenue management all in-house. So I have 60 plus employees um, that we built over the last 15 years to execute on getting yield out of storage. So that's our one of our main ways. The other way you can do it is you really have a conversion or development and we've done huge things with that. You know, we have a conversion that's actually up for sale right now. We have offers at over 30 million that um, five years ago, we built for 7 million and put two and a half million into it. And we'll sell it now for over 30 million in five years. Um, and that was a conversion that's transforming one type of asset into another, a bankrupt super, super Kmart into a storage, which used to be really good. Then that kind of caught on and watered down. So now we've moved into another one, which during the finance or during right when COVID started and things got really, really hairy, we actually bought office buildings and turning downtown office buildings into a storage complex. Then you have a just straight development with that too, ground up as everyone knows. The third strategy is um, you're just buying and holding and you're just trying to uh, do traditional uh, investing strategy. You're looking for safety, cash flow, 
um, and tax advantages. So more of a stabilizing. That's really the three strategies that there are in self-storage, but self-storage to really do well, it's an operations game. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people misunderstand. Storage is a business, right? And the operators that are good in self-storage outperform the other operators by leaps and bounds. And it's something that new people get into it and they're shocked by. They're shocked by how much it's a daily reoccurring thing, right? Like we view it as a retail store. And so we use tech and data to get high yields, revenue management systems like um, airplanes, right? So you're on an airplane, everybody sitting in a different seat has a different price. We implement the same thing through uh, our tech stack. Wow, love it. So that's where as an operator, you can win. And I imagine, I mean, I used to have a, a self-storage unit especially when I moved into my first house and then we were just totally outgrowing that. And then we moved into this one and we had so much extra stuff. And, you know, I, I never talked to anybody. I just keyed in, I, yep. I keyed into the garage. I keyed out. There was sometimes one like young dude sitting in the management office. Yep. Um, otherwise it was pretty much fully automated. So when yep. you talk about winning as an operator, are there some people that are still like manually running these and then, and they're kind of losing the yeah. game? So the mom and pop ones, right. They're still self-storage blew up and really got big um, after 2008, right? Mm -hmm. Before that, nobody wanted to be in it, but that's where the vast majority of the assets had been built, but they were all built by mom and pop. There was really no investor professionals in it. So that meant that there's a huge plethora of mom and pop operators that have been around for decades that are operating a self-storage facility like they did in the past. And how you operate a self-storage facility has changed at you know 100%. It's totally different now. And so these are people that are operating it. They're sitting in a chair. They let somebody go in. They're only focusing on occupancy. They want it to be hands off. They're making their money and they're done, right? Those are the ones we buy. We implement technology. Um, we have like a franchise like system that we come in, everything looks the same. We have intense management styles, sales process. We add other lines of revenue and that revenue just goes way up. I love it. I love it. So AJ, how has um, self-storage, obviously you mentioned 2008 and people lost jobs, had to consolidate, live from home. Of course, the self-storage became a big thing with, you know, just putting their stuff in new places because yeah. of the foreclosure crisis. Now, of course, you have a slightly different trend, which is people leaving office complexes and working from home. So how has self-storage evolved over the last two years? Yeah, self-storage is such an interesting asset class. And the story behind it is, is very fascinating. And through COVID, um, once again, self-storage outperformed everybody else. And it, and it did really, really well. And that was primarily because nobody lost their incomes because the government supplemented. Yet... Um, everybody was still buying things. They were working from home. We had mass migration due to COVID lockdowns and different states handling things differently, which made people start to move around like crazy. And so storage benefits from movement, right? Uh, so stagnation is really bad for um, self-storage. And when you're looking at what the downsides are to self-storage, um, really that's it. So when we look at things that may hurt self-storage, I look at rising interest rates, slowing down the housing market. That's really bad for self-storage because if you don't have movement, you can't replace the people that are moving out. These are month-to-month -month leases. And it's also for most of the United States, very seasonal. And if you don't have movement, you're not replacing and you can't get higher rents and your occupancy start, starts to drop over time. So when you have movement, which the at first when COVID first hit, we saw occupancy drops, the lockdowns were horrible. So we had occupancy drops. We had states where they wouldn't let us raise prices. So we couldn't fill up. We couldn't raise, uh, raise prices, right? Um, now, states that were more open, self-storage did better. People were moving to them. We had movement within. So stagnation is bad. So once the lockdowns really got, self-storage really bounced back a lot better. And it also kind of put a pause on some of the development, which before COVID happened, we were actually seeing in metro areas like Dallas and others, that they were having a downtrend in rates that they were being able to charge. And they were increasing vacancy rates because there was, there's, I mean, we are on the back of the largest development expansion of this asset class. It, it's mind boggling how much they're building. And that was starting to hurt um, a lot of metro areas. And COVID kind of put a band aid on that. Okay. 
Wow. So the Band-Aid happens. People are now locked down for a while. The first, let's say, three to six months. And in some states, they're still locked down, which is crazy. Yeah. But whatever. Yep. Um, yep. Now, these people kind of unthaw from COVID. They realize, hey, maybe they're in a state that has too much restriction, or they just realize maybe they lost their job, or they could work remotely. And now the movement happens. Obviously, there's a lot of movement to the sunshine states. There's yep. a lot of movement to some cities that are um, adopting technology, like Salt Lake City and Columbus, yep. Ohio. Yes. So there's movement into those areas. So on a go forward basis, how are you and people like you going to monetize that movement and some of that the things that are happening now? This is a great question. Now, first and foremost, you have to understand self-storage is outrageously sensitive to demand. So the one thing that kills self-storage is oversupplied, too much products, too much markets. So it's a balancing act. Lots of times we find also though, where people are moving and the states where lots of people are moving and we have high occupancies, that there's mass development going on. And you don't wanna get caught that when you have that, that mass movement slow down, that all of a sudden this new inventory hits the market while at the same time you're having a slowdown and you just have an oversupplied market, you can't come back from that. There's nothing you can really do. It really sinks all ships. So it's a combination of we're looking at growing markets, right? We're looking at underperforming facilities, but we're also most importantly, analyzing the high demand markets and self-storage. And that's why you can find markets even like Southern California that there, there's tons of demand because they won't allow anything to be built. So it's almost like monopolies that they have in there, right? So we find um, huge opportunity, let's say Texas, right? In areas of Texas, and they've had great returns in self-storage, but also in a lot of those areas, we see a lot of downside and risk that we have to be worried about. It's great if things keep going the way it's going, but if they don't, you're going to get hurt. So it's really a balancing act for when we're looking at that. That's why I prefer to find underperforming facilities that I can measure that spread in operation. So when I invest, I'm buying a storage facility. I don't even care about the future. I'm looking at the spread that I can yield immediately by changing operations and everything else. And that spread protects me and it gets me all the yield that I want. It gets me my returns. Then whatever the market does, anything else like that's on a cherry on top. And if I do it in a market that has high demand is not oversupplied, I protected myself for futures and also making sure that once I get that yield, it doesn't come back off. I love it. Um, so one of the conversations we're having, AJ, in the multifamily space is, you know, people are talking about building new, building new, building new, but they're talking about building and, you know, the cost is double sometimes. Yeah, what we can buy a distressed value at apartment complex at, like I'm making an offer on a $15 million building on Monday at a roughly 50,000 a door. And it's in a market that I'm already operating in. And then I had a conversation today about building new and that same, like, it's slightly different market, still in the same city, but you're talking about 200 or $230 a foot, which would put that same type, that same square footage, at like 150000 180000 for new construction because the cost of lumber is so big. So I'm, I'm, I'm on board with you by buying distressed value add, operationally yes. deficient or... Uh, and steel for us is the main driver and steel has quadrupled. I mean... We were, I was building literally four years ago or whatever it was at $30 a square foot. I'm putting things out of the ground at $130 a square foot right now. So you can see how there's going to be a lot of operators. You, if, if you're building today in self storage and you're building a nice facility, say it's indoor, you're at 130 bucks a square foot. You need to get the highest rates that are in the nation to really make this work. And so you have a lot of operators that are going to get in big trouble because they're putting new stuff out of the ground at the highest prices we've ever seen with high debt loads. And if you have a vacancy or a contraction in that uh, market because it's month to month, you, you could see a lot of operators get hurt and get in trouble. So we're really nervous about that. And once again, I'm building 650,000 square feet right now, net rentable square feet. So yeah. We're big builders. I'm built, but we're building in really high demand areas that are really hard to do. We're building totally different types of product that you've ever seen or in the marketplace that other people have never done. And we're doing it in areas where the revenue per square foot is double the nation's average. Nice. Nice. That's nice. the only places. I cut out 80% of the markets that we would have developed in pre-COVID, we won't touch now because they, the math doesn't even work anymore. Got it. You mentioned interest rates several times. And I think, look, the Federal Reserve 
only has a few tools left in their toolbox yes. and they're fighting obviously an economy that's still recovering. Uh, they're fighting obviously m- many uh, s- supply chain issues and then runaway inflation. And they need to raise rates to kind of temper the inflation a little yeah. bit. At the same time, one of the things we look at in commercial, obviously it affects apartments, it affects uh, self-storage, mobile homes, et cetera. But the Fed can't raise rates that fast or that much because the residential real estate market is so big, so much bigger than apartments or even self-storage that the faster they raise interest rates, the majority of average Americans, average homeowners, they hold their wealth in their house. Yep. And if they raise rates significantly, it's going to temper the market. And then people could even lose equity in their homes. 100%. So how much, what factors or what conversations are you listening to about interest rates that impact so the self-storage side of things? Is yeah. it so interest rates is really important, especially right now. And it has more to do for me with the cost of assets, the cost of building. We're in an area where the cost has exploded, right? And money is cheap. So it's actually buffered that cost to build. Right. We've, I mean, the amount of increase that we've seen in two years on building costs is historical. If you tie that, though, with an increased cost of capital, those historical numbers, it doesn't work anymore. So you, what you're going to have happen is the price of homes, the price of everything where it's at today, you increase the cost of capital for buyers. It, it doesn't make sense. In most markets, it's hard for buyers to even make these numbers work today at unprecedented low rates. It's a big worry for us because that market and that slowdown in that housing market directly will result in self-storage occupancy. Mm-hmm. So we have what I view as you have long-term occupancy, but then you also have more of this short-term occupancy that is due to movement. That short-term occup- occupancy in a, in a lot of markets can be huge, like 30%. Right. And that long term occupancy could, is like on average, we're talking what, maybe 1.5 to two years. And that's long term. So all of a sudden you slow down that housing market due to high interest rates and people stop moving. And, you know, you're going to really see that hit um, self storage as far as occupancies go. And then you have a downward cycle of rates as people try to fill up their occupancy. New builders have to get people in because they have to pay bills. And you start to see that deceleration of that revenue increase that they've seen during the opposite time when prices were going up, but everything was affordable. And that is a big, big thing we're looking at. I love it. Yeah. I love to see what's going to happen here. The Fed's hands are kind of tied. They're they're tied. And you know, we could enter into a Paul Volcker era era where Carter, you know, Paul Volcker allowed interest rates to rise to combat inflation, knowing and everybody knew it was going to tank the economy. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for Carter, it didn't matter. They had to do it. They had to stop inflation. They tanked the economy. Carter got kicked out. They put it into a recession, but they tamed interest rates. And that's an important thing to remember. At some point, it doesn't matter if they're going to put us into a recession. They have to do it. Yeah. And I think there's some argument that like obviously with there was the covid recession within the first 6 months when covid hit and all the lockdowns happened but the economy has roared right back since well, and it's important to know when you're looking at the data and one of the things that we do is is I don't listen to mainstream media at all we yeah. our own we have our own people we get core raw data we put it into models and we look at it there we have a whole team that actually does analysis for us and when we're looking at first of all you had a huge spike in savings rates At the same time, right now, we have the lowest velocity of money in the economy that we've had since, I mean, decades. We're talking prior to 1980. What that means is all this cash, and we've had an increase in the total capital in the markets by 40% in the last two years, the most money creation we've ever seen in the history of the world. So the money creation happened, savings happened, all the capital sitting around, and it's not moving in the economy. And people say, this is transitory, or this is a supply chain problem. China shipped more products last year than it did in the history. So they're, it's not that they're not products are moving around. That's not the problem. But the money isn't moving around. So when you look at that dollar moving through the economy, those dollars aren't even moving yet, and we're having inflation. What happens when those dollars start to move? What happens when we get the, all this mass amount of money um, that actually starts to go back to a normal velocity rate 
it's it'll be unprecedented. So uh, right now, that money is being held down. It's not moving through the economy. We're already having inflation. And really, that's kind of what you hope happens. You really hope this money doesn't start moving. That money really starts moving through the economy. And that's going to cripple us even further because we don't have a system. You know, the supply chain problems that we're having, it's not just because of COVID. It's because the supply chains were never built for this kind of demand and this much money. So mm-hmm. it's not like not having COVID will stop that, right? That money goes to work. Our supply chain cannot handle that much money moving through the economy at a normal velocity rate. Those are things that we worry about. Sure. And and that absolutely, that you're making so many great points there, economically, big picture, as well as, you know, very micro. Are you ready to automate and explode your real estate investing? We're searching for extremely motivated individuals who are sick and tired of wasting time and want to finally see real results from their real estate investing business. We're searching for investors looking to get to the next level and become a bigger, better version of themselves while being a more successful real estate investing entrepreneur. Apply for mentoring and coaching at joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. That's joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. Is your thesis then that at some point the money starts to move, inflation actually gets worse and higher, thus triggering the Volcker scenario where they have to raise interest rates substantially. Um, and Biden is essentially a Carter 2.0. The economy has to go into recession. Is, so, is, is so this kind of, kind of. not to the extreme. We've okay. done a lot since Carter to really get it, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. And I do not believe anybody that says it's not possible to have that happen again. You should worry about if anyone that talks in knowns like that, they don't know. I don't know. You sure. don't know. So it is possible. Likely, we don't believe it's likely. We do believe, though, that interest rates will rise, which is important to know that the effect of interest rates rising, we don't need interest rates to rise to 15% to ha- have ha- happen what happened to Carter, because we don't need it. it. The interest rates are so low, there's so much money right out there, and prices are so high due to supply chain problems and everything else, it doesn't need a 10-point basis. Right now, three points or uh, if, sorry, sorry, 300 basis points or 3% rise in interest rates would cripple the economy. With that said, though, it also shows how sensitive that capital is going to be. So that, that rise in interest rates is going to have an effect. And we think that'll keep that money down. And we think that'll help it. So we do believe interest rates will rise. Inflation, we do not believe is going anywhere. We will see persistent high inflation. The money's still there. It's got to move. It's got to go. That's not gone away. So the fundamentals that are causing inflation haven't changed. But mm-hmm. interest rates will help slow that down. So we think it's going to be this almost weird phase that we're in. We don't have super high interest rates, but we have super high costs with rising interest rates. And it's going to create a stagnation period. That's actually what we see most likely, which for that, we prepare micro and how we execute within these environments to make sure that these markets that have more downside than they do upside and assets that are at the top of the market are price, we're not buying. I'm buying in great markets with high demand, low performing assets, and just bringing them up to standard. And that's how I make my money. Everything else is great. If it happens, great. But I'm not betting on the economy to make me money. And that's a really dangerous thing right now to be betting on that things will just go up or keep going up. That's that's a risk we wouldn't take. We don't need, and two, we have the expertise to where we don't need. We can make you know incredible returns, not having the economy perform like it did in the last past five years. And in self storage, the last pi- past five years was unprecedented in total returns. And most of the people that have gotten into it, they didn't go through the Great Recession like we did, and mm-hmm. they're new into self storage and their performs now. They're modeling because they were around for the last three, four years, and they're modeling that to continue. That's ludicrous, right. because yeah. it's so out of the norm of what we've seen in performance, it's not going to perform like it did in the last five years or the next five years. It's, I mean, if you look at what that would just do to revenues, rates, and asset values, it's not even logical. The consumer can't sustain that. So it's, you know, we just don't see it happening. Yeah, I love it. We're having very similar conversations on the multifamily side. And the one thing that we're, we're, we're playing with when we look at our models is 
the fact that there's really no affordable housing out there. Yeah. And there's not a lot of affordable housing that's even being started by builders that people are just simply because of the low cost of money, prices keep going up. Inflation, like you said, keeps going up. There's more money in the system. Uh, values for single family homes keep going up. It's pricing people out of even buying a house. Cause if you can imagine if your house used to be 200,000, now it's 300,000 and you got to put 20% down. Even if you've got to put down three and a half percent on an FHA loan, three and a half percent on a $200,000 house is 14 grand or now it's 21,000 and your average it's new home buyer problem. in an apartment complex can't do it. So they're being forced to stay in apartments longer. So even though we're yes. modeling, interest rates going up and cap rates going up, we're subsequently modeling the rise of rents because there's more people that can't afford to buy a home. We could not agree more with your synopsis. We believe rents will keep rising. And what you said is really important. And I want to hit on this because it, it ties into multifamily plus storage. There's a misnomer that people think that it's people in apartments that rent home. That's actually not the biggest, uh, or excuse me, people in apartments that rent storage. That right. is not the biggest demographic at all. The biggest demographic is single family um, residents that are um, living in normal middle-class homes. That is our largest utilizer of self-storage. It is not apartment dwellers. Yeah, I believe and, it. Yeah, and that shocks a lot of people. And when you look at our overall performance, let me give you some, give you a number here. And let me tell you average. This is all my value add storage facilities that I talk about that I do, all of them combined. So I took an average of all of them in the last nine years. So we're rolling out our self-storage fund that we're doing this. We do value add storage. We just rolled it out this week. So what, we, what I did is I took all our past performance to show this, right? And right now, this is important for you to know, we have not sold any of these assets. So the numbers that I'm giving you is no sell at all. So we're not taking in a big sell at a high market at all. This is only cash flow. Our cumulative cash on cash return for my firm in the last nine years on all of our assets is 471%. Uh, total return, including equity, is over 1,300%, never selling one asset. That equates to a rolling average of 52% on average annual cash on cash return. Not IRRs, Damn. not accounts, cash wow. on cash. And now, once again, I don't expect that to do it, but that shows you. Now, go compare that same, uh, those same numbers in the cell storage average on REITs, everybody else, right? Go take it on cell storage alone. Those numbers don't exist. Or other operators, they get numbers like that. They have to sell the assets to actually, right, get the, get those that equity. We still own the assets. They still cash flow are in all of them. And what that shows, though, is the performance in self-storage amongst operators is astronomically different. Yeah. And that is due to running the business, not flipping anything else. That's really the joy. That's really, for me, why I love this asset class in this industry, because we could build a firm focused on technology and accessing yield, high demand markets, underperforming assets, right? And we don't need a big event for us to make great money. Yeah, I love it. That's fantastic. And this is the type of information, guys, for our audience that you're only going to get from a guy who's operating a super high level, one of the top 70 operators of self-storage in the world to be able to kind of produce these kind of numbers, but also understand their numbers and share them successfully. So AJ, I've got one more question for you. And this is really just around kind of what it takes to be successful. Um, you know, again, guys, if you want to learn some of the nitty gritty about how to buy and structure self-storage, go back and listen to my first interview with AJ. Again, it's episode 131, July of 2020. Um, which too, so, and I, I'll jump into this, but I also want to share the information on how we do, what we do, everything else like that. We don't, I give all of it away a hundred percent. So right. I tell it is, it is, I don't hold anything back. I don't think it's very important for me to be transparent. And that's when you talk about what makes a successful entrepreneur and what are the things that really drive. I view a few things. Those numbers didn't happen overnight. Long-term thinking for successful entrepreneurs is so, so important. 
Um, we are taking years worth of work, including years where me and my three, three partners, who's my father and my brother-in-law, we built our management company. We have reinvested into our company for five, six years. And I didn't, we didn't take any money out. No, not a salary, nothing. And so the cost to get those returns right to us was big. So I find the most successful people are so long-term. Me and my partner, who is my father, we worked another job during that time and reinvested everything back into the machine that could produce those numbers. And those numbers, by the way, are not compounded returns. Those are straight line averages of individual asset performance. And it doesn't take in anything to, that I'm saying that I did. That money though, that cash flow that came out of those returns, we kept returning in. So now we can get those returns off every deal, but it's this long-term thinking. We went through the great recession, right? We came out, we, bought, we, we have a strategy, we know our numbers, we stick to it, and we don't get distracted. Over the long-term, that yields numbers like that. Now, in the short term, though, it doesn't, right? So if you look in the short term, um, maybe we had a, a down year, or maybe it took us three years to get an asset to perform the way that we wanted it to. But we never wanted to be a short-term investor. And we never wanted to be in a position where we had to make short-term decisions um, at the risk of long-term results. And I think that's really, really important. Yeah. Uh, we just had a conversation yesterday, AJ, one of my partners said, look, if we sell this building now, we'll make 10 years of cash flow all at the sale. Yep. And I said, be careful. The conversation we had is I, I said, look, be careful because the point of the asset is to generate the passive income. We put in the work, yes. it could be a year, it could be four years, whatever it is, to generate the passive income. And then over the next 10 years, we have the passive income and the equity, which just continues to grow and grow and grow. So if you just take the one conversation, which is like, like you said, a very short-term kind of statement or a short-term question yeah. is why don't we just sell it? We'll make 10 years worth of equity at, or 10 years worth of cash flow at one time. Yes, but that's short term. You lose out on the depreciation, accelerated depreciation, appreciation, cash flow, the equity, 1031. The compounding nature of it all. Right. And the reputation, you know, all these types of things that we had planned on doing. Now, our smaller assets, sure, we could sell them, no big deal. We'll just roll them up into bigger, bigger deals. That makes sense. But just selling things off, all of a sudden, now you're a short term player again. Yes. Right. So, just had this conversation yesterday. So you mentioned long-term thinking. That's a big one. What, what other thing, traits, AJ, do you think there are to being really successful in this game? Next thing that I, I, you know, I want, want to touch on is you hear this a lot. Um, and it, it, well, there's two things. I'm going to hit on the first one. Being very clear on who you are, what you want, and what your strengths and weaknesses are. So me, I wanted to build an empire. I wanted to be a top performer in an industry, right? And so I had to make short-term sacrifices to reach those long-term goals. And I was very clear on what I was willing to give and do to hit that. That is not everybody. A lot of other people are like, I don't need to be a leader. I don't need to be this. Maybe I want passive income. Well, then maybe you shouldn't be building it on your own, but you should be investing with other people. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have a smaller mark, right? So what I did is not something that somebody else should do. Now, if you want the results, though, you have to be very clear with yourself on what it's going to take. You have to accept those and you have to go and you really have to make the sacrifice as well, right? I am the hardest worker in our business, right? And all my employees know it. Nobody's outworking me because my goals, I am very realistic about what we're trying to achieve. And we're seeing the fruits of that, but we're talking, this is... 15 plus years and the amount of sacrifices we had to make and, and get there. So being very clear on who you are, what you want and what you're willing to do to get it is really important. And that comes down to happiness. That comes down to everything. Don't fool yourself. Don't copy what somebody else is doing, right? It's got to be based upon your strengths and weaknesses. So I am dyslexic. And I am uh, ADHD, right? I know this. So I have to put in systems in place in my life to keep me organized. And I'm very rigorous about it. There's people in my life that look at every detail. They're measuring everything, right? I have handlers, right? Because I know that I need that in my life and I'm okay with it. And I recognize those weaknesses. And I, you know, it's one of those things that some weaknesses 
I always need to be working at getting better. But there's other weaknesses that I need to say, the energy that I put into this weakness will never yield a result. And that's just kind of intrinsic. And I just got to come to Jesus and say, hey, it is what it is. Yeah. And then I need to focus on my strengths. Love it. Love it. So that clarity is big. Matter of fact, AJ, I was, I was watching um, the Tom Brady special on ESPN Plus, right? Man in the Arena. Yeah. Just this morning when I was working out, and one of the comments that he made I thought was so good about what you just said is that Tom Brady said, listen, 50 years from now, nobody's going to give a shit about the seven or Super Bowls that I won. I'll be in the Hall of Fame. I'll be probably dead. I'll be 94 years old. Nobody's going to give a shit. But So what matters, regardless of the wins and the losses, is did I do something that made me feel fulfilled? Did I have joy and relationships in that moment. That's what was most important. Yes. And so to hear someone like you, $100 million portfolio, top 70, op, you know, massive portfolio, million square feet you're developing, Tom Brady talking about like seven Super Bowls and really none of that shit matters. What matters is the joy of today. Is that in line with who you are and what your goals are? Yeah. That's such a good personal message for our audience. It's not about how many units, you don't own 4,000 units like Josh Cantwell. You don't have this massive self-storage like AJ. So what? Doesn't matter. What's going to make you happy, right? Is do you, get, do you get joy and fulfillment from the work like AJ is talking about? Mm -hmm. right? Do you get joy and fulfillment of like coaching youth sports like, I, like you guys all know I enjoy? The joy of being able to lay your head down at night on the pillow and thinking, damn, I had fun today. That's what's most important. And lying to yourself and just going, and this can be really hard for people. So I'm an avid skier and fly fisherman, right? And I used to think that that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to literally be a ski bum and, and a fly fisherman. And I was like, oh, I, I never even wanted to work in an office. But what I found was that actually the reason I liked that was because I liked being with other people and I liked achieving goals. So we had all these things that we were trying to do and we had metrics that we were competing and trying to hit. It had actually nothing to do necessarily with those activities. Yes, I like the outdoors, everything else like that. And so when you get to the root causes, that's really important. What I found is I love going, I love taking risks, I love hitting goals. And I love working with other people. So for me, I want to get into the office. I want to go do those activities with other people, everything else. And that can be hard to actually come out with the, what the root driver is of you. And that root driver can be applied to a lot of different circumstances. So it's about finding the root driver and then applying it into circumstances that will yield the results that you want. And those that, that, that's something that a lot of people miss hobbies, or I think like they, they view like something is, oh, well, I like this. Well, just because you like playing video games doesn't mean that that's your purpose, your strength or anything else, right? You need to find what it is about that, find, go to the root cause and then apply it to something that yields great things for you. Then all of a sudden you love what you're doing. You're happy with the life you're building and the outcomes. And that's the goal. Absolutely. AJ, that's fantastic. I almost feel like we should wrap up there. Um, because that was so well said. So before we sign off, um, you know, I know there's a lot of people in our uh, group, our audience, our listeners who will want to connect with you. I know they can go to ajosborne.com. I know you have this new podcast. Just tell us where people can connect with you. Yeah. So we are the, um, leading authority in self-storage, our self-storage podcast, self-storage income. It's the largest by far on self-storage. Um, also the number one best-selling book, Investor's Guide to Growing Wealth on Self-Storage. So we have two sides. I have the AJ Osborne podcast, everything else, which is all business, economics, things like that. Then we have pure self-storage, where our only goal is to be the leader. That's also including YouTube. Once again, we tell everything. Like it, it's, we don't hold back secrets, nothing, because I, I, I don't deal. I'm like, yeah, good luck trying to do what we did in 15 years. By the time I give you all my secrets and you do it, which you can, you can take everything I did, but I'm going to be light years in the other direction. So we hold nothing back. We tell everything on either um, AJ Osborne or self-storage income, either one of those YouTube podcast or just Instagram, AJ Osborne, and we show data numbers, everything else. Oh, great stuff today, AJ. Listen, man, thanks for carving out some time. It's great to reconnect with you after 18 months and you congrats too, man. on all your success. Hey, thanks, man. It was great talking. You were just listening to the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something new, help us build the AI community 
by leaving a review and five-star rating on our iTunes podcast channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode. To see passive investing opportunities, visit freelandventures.com slash passive. To start your journey toward the lifestyle you've always dreamed of with multifamily apartments, apply for one-on-one -on -one coaching with Josh at www.joshcantwellcoaching.com.